still stand a little bit okay. Uh, before I start actually doing things myself, do you have any questions or additional questions to the one you already had uh, regarding the E plus and minus physics we did yesterday and two days ago? Everything's clear? So no one needs an exam at the end, right? Uh, okay, good. So uh, we're going into something different now. Uh, we're going to look into something called deep elastic scattering, DIS for friends. Uh, anyone knows, or well, anyone knows what DIS is about? What type of system is it supposed to describe? So, deviastic scattering is really about trying to collide electrons and, and hadrons. So, the most simple version of this would be trying to collide an electron on one side and, say, a proton on the other side. And how would this go? What's the type of interaction you can have between an electron and a proton? Electromagnetic. I mean, the electron hardly interacts with anything else. Uh, electroweak, if you want to make it a bit more generic. But the basic principle is you'll have a photon. There's uh, an electron. Let me put a prime on the outgoing one to distinguish it from the uh, incoming one. And this photon somehow interacts with a proton. All right? Uh, I'm going to talk about inclusive deep elastic scattering, which means the proton is going to break because of this interaction, or potentially break because of this interaction, and it goes into X, with X being whatever you want. There are more refined versions of this, like semi-inclusive deep elastic scattering, things like that, where you ask that this gives you something like, I don't know, a pion or a neutron or something uh, plus x or plus y. But in this case, I'm just going to keep, ba keep staying basic and discuss, let's x be anything you want, all right? Uh, a quick note in passing, I've started compiling a list of references. Uh, I'll give it to you later. I'll send it to you, and so I guess it can be put on the, uh, on the GGI webpage or on the school webpage. Uh, I still have some blanks in the list, so I'll wait until it's more or less complete uh, uh, to pass it to you. Uh, this is still part of a series of lecture notes I made 10 years ago. I'm roughly going to follow what I had there, dropping lots of the calculations and some of the details to try and make it shorter. But at least there are some handwritten notes. Sorry, it's handwritten, not later. That was 10 years ago. I was much less professional than I'm doing today. Uh, so, back to business. Uh, I need a few notations, as usual, so I'm going to denote by k the momentum of this guy, uh, k prime the momentum of this outgoing guy, this is a photon of momentum Q, and proton has momentum P, and X, I don't care at this stage. So why do you want to do such a collision? To probe what's inside the proton. And is there any kinematic regime that you'd be interested in in order to try to probe what's inside the proton? Very small wavelength. So the, the, the real idea behind this type of collision is to use the photon as, as a probe of the, of the structure of the proton. And to do that, to get the fine detailed structure of the proton, you want the wavelength of the proton to be as small as possible. So you essentially, in, in, in other direction, in the other way, you want the virtuality of the photon to be as high as possible. So typically, this photon is virtual, so it has a virtuality, say, q square, which is minus q square, which is going to be large. So we're going to work in the limit where the photon is highly virtual, and with this highly virtual photon, we hope to be able to learn something about the structure of the proton. All right? So this is what this lecture is about, trying to see what are the basic things we can learn, the basic objects we can learn 
about the structure of the proton here. So uh, as usual, I start with basic kinematics uh, in, this, in this kind of setup. There's uh, a few variables that you can define. There's S, which is the total center of mass energy, which are probably not going to use that much, P plus K squared. Again, the electron here is mostly is mostly a spectator. I'll show you that explicitly in a second. Uh, so what, you, what you're really interested in is the photon-proton system, all right? Uh, so you usually denote it by W square, the proton-photon center of mass energy, just standard notations, uh, and Q square, as I said there, Q square, which is minus Q square, the virtual unit. If you wish, you, if you forget about the electron, you have a collision between a proton and uh, some photon with some some sort of a mass, okay, uh, or a given virtuality. Uh, these are the basic things you can introduce. Uh, often in the literature, you find another set of variables which are new, which is in conventions, uh, different books or different uh, papers have different conventions for new, uh, which is the scalar product on P and Q. There's Y, which is uh, P dot Q divided by P dot K. And there is X, which is Q squared over two new. Each of those can be written in terms of those. Uh, for example, P dot Q, if you use this guy, P dot Q is just W squared plus Q squared. Uh, so you have, well, it's new is W squared plus Q squared over two by just uh, expanding the square here, neglecting the mass of the proton. I'm working at high Q squared, so again, I'm just neglecting the mass of the proton in this, in this limit. Uh, y, in this case, can be uh, W squared plus Q squared over S. Again, neglecting the mass of the electron and neglecting the mass of the proton, P dot K is, is essentially uh, S over two. And in that case, Q squared over 2 nu is Q squared over Q squared plus W squared. So you can trade any set of variables in here. You mostly have exactly two independent degrees of freedom in this case. If you, if you think about the photon-proton system, there's essentially just two variables in the game, which are W squared and Q squared. Uh, so I'm usually people either work with W square and Q square, or in order to have only one dimensional full variable and the other one dimensionless, and this is the, the, the thing I'm going to follow, uh, I'm going to use the two variables as X and Q squared. So these are the two variables I'm going to use throughout uh, this lecture. So essentially the limit we're interested in is large Q squared with X fixed. Uh, that's the meaning of X is going to become clearer in uh, as we proceed. Uh, you can do different stuff. There's a whole set of uh, of studies, and and I could give a whole lecture, even series of lectures, on what happens if you take Q square fix and take small X. Uh, different kind of physics. I'm not going to touch that here. Uh, maybe briefly uh, mention the connection at some point, but that's it. Uh, one very quick note about uh, something which is actually very nice about this is if you say that there is an angle theta, which is the deflection angle of your, so you have an electron beam, a proton beam on the opposite side, uh, you make a, colli a collision of this, the, the electron is going to have a deflection angle Okay, the outgoing electron is going to have a deflection angle compared to the initial, uh, the initial electron. Uh, you can actually relate, there's, there's a symbol, it's, it's a back of an envelope calculation again, uh, first grade, uh, first year grade kinematics uh, in relativistic kinematics. You can trade the energy 
So based on the energy of the beam, so if you fix the energy of the beam, so if you fix the energy of K and the energy of the proton beam, you can actually trade between the energy of the outgoing electron and, and theta. There's a unique relation between the energy and the angle and x and q squared. Uh, this is important. I think this is, this is, practically speaking, this is important because it means that if you do an experiment like this, okay, if you just measure the outgoing electron, so the only thing you're measuring is the outgoing electron, you measure its energy and its scattering angle, you know all the kinematic dependence, all the main kinematic dependence of the hadronic system as well. Inclusively again. The minute you start getting exclusive on the, uh, or semi-inclusive on the hadronic part of the system, this, this stops working. You start needing to have some, to need some kinematic information about the X part as well. But for all that I'm going to say here, the only thing you need is a measurement of the electron. And this is something which, practically speaking, is much easier than starting to dwell into, uh, in, or to dive into, uh, into hadronic measurements. Okay? So experimentally speaking, this is quote-unquote a simple measurement. Again, bearing in mind the, uh, cav the potential caveats I mentioned yesterday. Something I forgot to ask yesterday. Is there anyone here who's actually experimentalist? I, no one threw anything at me yesterday when I tried to swipe those details into the work, so my gut feeling is no, but... Uh, all right, so... Uh, this is known as the Bjorken limit. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the electron. So imagine you want to compute such a thing like that. What you're going to do is, is mostly square that, uh, square that graph. And so if you square that graph, you're essentially going to have something like a photon here, photon there, this blob I have on one side, the blob I have on the other side, whatever x is here in the middle, uh, proton, proton, okay, that's the amplitude, complex conjugate amplitude. And I'm actually going to put everything inside uh, an even bigger blob, okay? Uh, if you try and compute a diagram like this, there's a photon here, there's a photon there. Whatever you do, the structure of this graph is always going to be the same. There's always going to be a trace somewhere over your, your lepton at the top and something related to the hydronic part at the bottom, okay? Uh, I'm again doing inclusive things, uh, unpolarized beams. The minute you start uh, doing, I don't know, polarized electrons beam, uh, you get into more complicated stuff, but at least for what matters here, the, the square root of the amplitude is always going to have the form of some leptonic part here, and since the photon is spin one uh, a vector, uh, this carries Lorentz indices, contracted somehow with a hadronic tensor at the back, at the bottom. So there's a leptonic part for the top, there's a hadronic part from the bottom, uh, and again, uh, the leptonic part is, is just uh, basic Feynman, graph, Feynman rules. Uh, it's just going to be E squared times the trace of uh, K slash, if K is the momentum here, times gamma mu, K prime slash gamma nu. And this is just, again, that's something everyone here uh, is probably able to do. This is just for e squared k mu k prime mu uh, plus k nu k prime mu uh, minus uh, g mu nu prime. So this is known. Okay, that's what I mean. But I can actually 
think of this as a collision between a photon. When I, when I say here, I can think of this as a collision between a photon and a proton. It essentially relies on two things. One is I can really factor out or separate the leptonic part from whatever I'm interested in, which is this guy here. And also, even in an experimental point of view, uh, by just measuring the electron, I'm actually knowing all the interesting variables in that, uh, in that W guy. Okay? So, what you're left with, generically speaking, is there's a W mu nu, which depends on x and q square, which you want to know about, okay? Is there anything simple you can start doing with W mu nu? What structure do you expect in there? It's Lorentz invariance. So globally speaking, you can write it down as A times P mu P nu plus B P nu, well, Q nu, uh, Q mu, Q nu, plus C, Q mu, P nu, plus D, P Q, uh, plus E, G mu nu. All right, so that's the generic Lorentz structure you can get here. Uh, modular detail we'll come back to later. Uh, now there's a constraint. This has to satisfy word identities that if you take Q mu to zero, uh, this, uh, the contraction here, Q mu times W mu nu, or Q, let me try to respect Lorentz's position. So Q nu times W uh, mu nu equals zero. And if you actually impose these conditions, what you get at the end of the day is that W mu nu of x and q squared can be written as, and then let me try not to get any signs wrong, g mu nu uh, plus q mu q nu over, oh, it's a minus here, and it's a plus, over q squared times w1 of x and q squared plus uh, p mu plus q Q mu over to x, uh, P nu plus Q nu over to x, W2 of x and Q squared. With W1 and W2 being essentially, well, these conditions allow you to get rid of three of these guys and the rest are essentially called W1 and W2. Uh, other notations typically involve, well, in, instead of W1 and W2, you often use, and that's what I'm actually going to do, F1, uh, which is exactly a state, uh, a replacement of W1, and F2, which is actually new times W2, uh, think that these two are dimensionless while W2 is not. Uh, and often you find also FL, which is F2 minus 2x F1. The L here stands from the fact that this, is actually, this actually corresponds to the longitudinal polarization of the, uh, of the photon. So the great part in here, well, we haven't done much at this stage, right? But the great part in here is that I've boiled down everything that you want to know, again, inclusively, all right, in a, in a very simple context, all the inclusive information you want to know about, about these, uh, the, this, this photon-proton interaction is just summarized into two functions of x and q squared. So all I'm left with now is trying and, is try and understand how W1 and W2, or F1 and F2, depend on x and q squared, and if I know that, I know the interaction between a photon and a proton. All right? So a little, just a little note here. In practice, the structure can be a bit more complicated. For example, uh, you may decide to, uh, this is a photon exchange. Uh, you can have an exchange of a Z boson as well, which will introduce probably other corrections in here. Uh, you can also have flavor changing currents in here. You can have uh, an electron, a W boson here, going to a neutrino, and, and in that case, this is, in, in principle, this can happen. If you're making electron-proton collisions, you can actually have cases in which you don't have an electron going out, but you have a neutrino going out. Uh, this is related 
to this expression in the sense that you also, in principle, have, uh, have gamma 5 terms that you, can, that you can introduce in here. And in practice, the net effect of this is that you'll have a third F3 function that comes additionally to this, uh, which can be measured as well, which has been measured as well, although it involves neutrinos, so it's always uh, more delicate to do experiments with neutrinos than with electrons. Uh, but this is also uh, this is also something that has that, that can be considered. Uh, something else that you can do is, in principle, vary the target. So you can scatter electron off deuterons, heavy nuclei, all these kinds of hadronic objects. And so, in principle, you do have structure functions that depend on the object, the hadronic objects that you scatter off. All right. So that said, the first thing people have tried to do here is say, what if, what's the simple model of the proton that you can think of? Forget about your knowledge of QCD. What's the simple model of the proton? What's the simple model of any particle that you can think of? There's two options, right? Either it's a fundamental particle, elementary particle, or, or it's composite of elementary particles themselves. So you can say, imagine that the proton is made itself of a bunch of elementary particles, all right? In that case, it means that these particles need to be charged because they interact with a photon. And I'll take them as, uh, as uh, spin one half fermions uh, straight off because, I mean, let's not be too stupid here. We know that we're heading to quarks at the end. Uh, so this means that actually this interaction between a photon and a proton looks something like I do have a photon, and that photon interaction interacting with a, pro with a proton actually is in interaction with some fermion. I may slip and call it a quark at some point. Uh, and there's an interaction that actually looks like this. And so this is... Uh, the basis of the parton model. It's some kind of sometimes called, or and it's actually related to, but not exactly the same, uh, there's, there's historical differences. Uh, the handbag model for the proton, uh, mostly because you can uh, see this as a handbag. Uh, okay, analogies in physics go, uh, well, right, okay. Uh, and so this is what we're going to discuss for, uh, for a few minutes, all right? Uh, the first thing I want, uh, I want to do here is just introduce a few notations that I will have to use through the rest uh, of the lecture. The first thing I'm going to do is introduce an extra vector. I'm going to introduce an extra vector. Is there any corner I can do this so I can, not, I can avoid having to erase this later? Maybe this one is the best one. So I'm going to introduce a vector n so that n squared is 0. So another uh, light-like vector. So that n dot, uh, I think n dot p is 0 as well. I want, sorry, n dot p is 1. And n dot q is 0. I think this uh, more or less makes sense. So I'm just introducing one light-like vector like this. Uh, and in that sense, any four vector, uh, forget about K being the momentum of the proton, uh, of the lepton now, I'm forgetting about the lepton. So any four vector K can always be written as some component along the, uh, along the direction of P, some component along the direction of N, uh, sorry, mu, and some component transverse to these two directions. If k is, uh, well, you, you can put this as any, any constant. I can call this beta and live with psi beta and the two transverse components. It's often, for what I'll have to say in the future, helpful to work, instead of working with just the bare, the, the row component of the, uh, along the n direction, to introduce the, uh, the square momentum of k as a, as a variable. And in this case, well, you can compute the square of this using these relations. And what you find is that you get some k per squared plus k squared over uh, 2 psi uh, 
as a coefficient here. So in that sense, I'm actually parametrizing any four vector as a contribution in the direction of, of the incoming proton, a transverse direction, and something uh, along the direction which satisfies those properties, which is orthogonal to Q and so on and so forth. Uh, in particular, you can write down Q in that way and Again, trying to stick to the notations I have here, otherwise this is quickly going to become a mess. Uh, this is Q pure mu plus nu times n mu. With Q squared equals minus Q per squared. Well, equals to, if you wish, the squared of the two vector Q perp. Uh, this is also helpful because based, you can actually use N and P to actually directly contract them with, uh, with W mu nu and find expressions which will directly, extra directly extract W1, W2, or F1, F2 uh, by contracting with N and M. And the, ex the corresponding expressions are F2, F2 is actually the main one, okay, that that's, uh, will become clear at some point, is n mu, n mu times uh, w mu nu, and f l is 4x squared over nu, p mu, p nu, w mu nu. So if I just want to focus, instead of computing the whole beast of W mu nu, I can just introduce these projectors and compute either FL or, or FT. So you can actually do the trick. Use this and say that I have a momentum K here. So P, this is Q, and this is P plus Q. Uh, sorry, P plus Q plus K plus Q and start computing this. Again, this is a get somewhere in the middle, same way as the other guy was. Uh, of all the building bits and pieces you'll have in this graph, is there any thing that you can expect will have some interest in the discussion? Any kinematic constraint? There's at least one uh, here, all right? Uh, if I have a point-like object that I'm interacting here, that point-like object is somewhere in the final state. And if it's somewhere in the final state, it means it is on shell. And remember, I'm neglecting all masses. Even if this is massive, um, again, I'm working at high enough Q squares. So if there are masses correction, there are going to be power correction of that mass over mass squared over Q squared. So uh, in the limit of interest, this is, this is negligible. So you'll have somewhere a constraint that delta of K plus Q squared is, is, has to be implemented. And so if you expand that using this parameterization and, and the kinematic variables, it can be written as delta of k squared minus q squared plus 2 psi nu minus some uh, transverse bit. Yeah, good. Uh, now remember, I'm working in the large Q square limit. So in the large Q square limit, again, K, think about K as a constituent of the proton. Uh, the typical transverse scale that K is going to have is of the order of the mass of the proton. Uh, K does know nothing here about the external. So the typical transverse scale here is, is expected to be of the order of the mass of the proton, so it's expected to be small. Again, uh, not a proof, but an expectation. Uh, so this means that in a large Q square limit, I can neglect this contribution here. Corrections are going to be powers of K over Q square, which are 
uh, suppressed in the high Q squared limit. And if I do that, I can factor out uh, 1 over 2 nu from this expression and uh, use the expressions I have. Again, k square here, same thing. k square can be neglected compared to q square, which is here. So if I factor out from this expression a 1 over 2 nu, what do you get is a 1 over 2 nu delta of psi minus q square over 2 nu, and q square over 2 nu, if you remember, is exactly x. All right? Why is this magnificent? X is fixed. X is fixed. I'm working the limit where I'm trying to understand F2 NFL at a given value of X and Q squared. There are functions of X and Q squared, uh, but that's almost, uh, that's almost what I want you to hear. Psi is fixed. In this expression, the quark, or sorry, the parton, the constituent of the proton, can have any momentum xi. I haven't specified at all what xi was. In principle, it's an internal momentum that you need to integrate over and so on and so forth. Uh, this tells you if my photon interacts with a constituent of the proton, in this limit, the longitudinal fraction of that object in the direction of the proton has to be fixed by x. So by varying, uh, think about this. If I measure an outgoing electron with a given angle and given energy, based on that angle of energy, I can deduce x and q square. I'm telling you with at that x, that x I've measured in one experimental event, I know that I've provided q square is large enough. I know that I have interacted with a constituent of a given longitudinal momentum of the proton. This is far from a trivial statement, all right? Uh, if you do that, you can actually project F2. I, I won't do the calculation. This is a, I'll do something much more complicated later, so this is considered basic level uh, or triviality. You can actually compute F2, integrate over, assume this is some operator B, say fermionic operator B to make things a bit more simple here. Uh, and you can actually write down uh, this as eq squared, eq being the charge of, I know q uh, jumping ahead and saying this is a quark, being the electromagnetic charge of the guy we're interacting with, eq squared times x times some function I will call q of x, and if you calculate actually this graph, q of x can be written, then take the form like d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, times trace of B here being the operator down there, delta of X minus I. Again, it's just assuming this is a fermi unique operator. You close the loop. You do whatever you want for the bottom here. Is in saying it just closes the loop in whichever way you want. I, don't, I just don't give a damn. I don't give a damn because I'm just going to hide everything into a function that I'll call q. All right? So in the high q square limit, assuming the only assumption I've made was that I'm interacting with point-like objects, what I do get is this. Uh, Fermi x spin one half uh, objects in this case. What is beautiful about this? What does the right-hand side depend on? What does the left-hand side depend on? Well, remember what we started from. Look at things there. In principle, the left-hand side, sorry, in principle, F1 and F2 are functions of x and q squared. What this tells you is that F2 is independent of q squared. <laughs> 
This is actually an important result. Uh, we'll see how it gets changed in the next hour. But this is an important result called Bjorken scaling. The fact that if you do interact a photo, an interaction between a photon, virtual photon, highly virtual photon, and a proton, a priori, this interaction depends on x and q squared. It's a generic function of x and q squared. In this point-like interaction picture, it's independent of q squared. Again, a highly non-trivial statement. A generic function. If I'm asking you uh, random functions of x and q squared, uh, the phase space for q squared independent, uh, the measure of the phase space for q squared independent functions is essentially zero in that in that full two variables phase space, okay? In the phase space of two variables functions. Uh, in the early experimental days of deep elastic scattering, that was actually working reasonably well. So while in early reasonably high energy uh, electron proton colliders were built 30 years ago, or 20 years ago, maybe even, no, 30 probably. Uh, measurements of the F2 structure function was reasonably independent of Q square. And so that was considered a very good indication that the proton was indeed made of point-like objects. So again, thinking about these, uh, uh, I told you this is a fairly introductory lectures, set of lectures on QCD at colliders. Uh, there's always, in this case, connections with the early days when uh, we were trying to assess QCD as, as a theory of nature, uh, a theory of strong interactions, or also trying to do precision measurements in, 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 uh, in more modern ways. So the same way that we saw that basically measuring CF and all these objects at, at E plus E minus collisions were indications of uh, uh, of the validity of QCD and being able to do precision measurements is can be nowadays a good measure a good way of measuring alpha s in this sense this kind of relation was helpful in trying to assess QCD as a, the a theory of strong interactions and there's something else I wanted to say but I completely forgot about it uh, another Conviction in this case, if you, well, I've computed F2 here. You can try to compute FL in the same way. And if you try to compute FL in the same way, I'm actually not sure I'm doing it somewhere uh, in the lectures. Uh, you actually show that compared to F2, FL is actually suppressed by one over Q squared. All right? And I won't have the time to show this. I actually don't even have it in, uh, in the notes, I think. Uh, the relation between FL built as a function of F1 and X2, in particular the fact that there's a factor of 2 here, uh, is actually an indication that the particles you're interacting with has been 1 half. So if you, were into, if you can try to repeating the same exercise with different spins for the point-like objects, you, will, uh, you, will get, uh, you always tend to get some combination of F1 and F2 which vanishes. But the fact that it's F2 minus 2 XF1 is something that's directly related to, uh, to the fact that the, 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 the particles you do interact with are, are spin one-half particles. Again, trying to uh, discuss this in the framework of... Uh, QCD being the, uh, the, the, the valid theory of strong interactions. Uh, maybe just a bunch of uh, quick remarks on this uh, that will be helpful for the future. Uh, you can actually give a physical interpretation of Q of X in this case, all right? In this case, Q of X is the density of partons in the proton with longitudinal momentum fraction x. Uh, said that differently, if I take an interval in x between x and x plus delta x, I will have an average Q of x times delta x, such quarks or partons inside the proton. 
All right? So it's literally a density of particles carrying a given fraction of the proton's momentum in a, again, in a frame where the proton is, is flying fast in one direction. Uh, generally speaking, we now know that uh, there's not just one quark, there's different uh, flavors of quarks. So uh, this, uh, this quantity can actually be introduced nowadays for any flavor of quark. So you could, you could have in principle uh, u of x, uh, u bar of x, uh, d of x, d bar of x, and so on and so forth for a uh, strange charm, for example, and even B quarks, if you go to high enough energy, uh, to my knowledge, there has never been any uh, top density in the, in the proton discussed. Uh, I may be wrong on this. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you will have the relation that F2 is just the sum over all quark flavors of x times the charge of that one times q of x plus q bar of x. This is just the trivial generalization of, uh, of this thing about multiple flavors just being a different, uh, different types of fermions that you can have in this, uh, that you can interact with. Uh, there are constraints, right? At the end of the day, you want that uh, once you integrate over everything, every possible moment, uh, we expect the proton to be made of two up quarks and one d quarks, which means, for example, that if you do want, if you do integrate between zero and one dx, uh, q of x, say u of x minus u bar of x, so the total number, the net u charge of the proton, if you wish, that's supposed to give you two because that's the number of up quarks in the proton that we know at the end of the day. And a similar thing for d minus d bar, which is supposed to integrate to one. Uh, so there are some level of constraints between these objects. And, and I think this is almost all I wanted to say, modulo one thing. No, this is modulo two things, actually. Uh, so q of x here is known as uh, the part on distribution function or PDF. So the that's probably a word you've heard at some point. Uh, this is essentially where it comes from. So in this infinite q square limit, a proton is made of a bunch of quarks or partons, each of them carrying a fraction x of the total infinite proton momentum, and these, the, the distribution of these partons as a function of x is called the parton distribution functions. So there's several flavors of this. That's the last comment I want to make here. Uh, in principle, there are ways to start and, and telling u from u bar, d from d bar, and so on and so forth, essentially by, by, by assuming these objects are universal. So say, for example, deuteron is made of, uh, of one proton and one neutron. The neutron is essentially the same as the proton by inverting u and d, and so in that case, if you assume that these objects are universal, then you can know exactly the contents of the deuteron is not going to be exactly, is going to depend differently on u, d, u bar, d bar compared to the proton. So if you scatter both on, an elect on the proton and on the deuteron, you can actually try and separate essentially the u from the d's and the u bar from the d bar. Uh, similar kind of thing if you do uh, charge currents experiments, charge currents are going to behave again, if they, they interact with, with via Ws, and Ws are going to mix Us and Ds, and again, in this case, by measuring both the F2 and the F3 structure functions in these type of experiments, you can start separating uh, different flavors, uh, different flavors, flavors as well. Any questions at this, at this stage? So to just a, a very uh, brief summary, you start by 
this type of collisions. You realize you can only make, view this as a collision between a photon probing a proton. And in that sense, you only have to worry about two functions, f1 and f2, say, which depend on, generally speaking, on x and q square. And if you assume that you do interact with point-like objects, which we know based on, uh, well, on point-like objects, you do get the remarkable result that at the end of the day, this function does not depend on both x and q square. It only depends on x via a, a density of objects or distribution of objects inside the protons, okay? And we know that these are spin one half because FL is, is actually suppressed in practice. What's next? Anyone has an idea? So I'm going to follow exactly the same logic as what we did for E plus and minus collisions. Remember, uh, we started discussing, dis discussing E plus E minus going to QQ bar. All right. Uh, that was simple. This is, this is the same thing. We're really doing a quark photon going to quark photon in, in a way. Uh, and, and, and fine, it's just that we're now having some proton in some fuzzy object or complicated objects like a proton in the initial state, so it's a bit more involved than E plus E minus going to QQ bar. But it's about the same thing. Uh, yeah. So now we do know that in practice there is a QCD that can enter in that kind of picture. So the most simple thing you can, you can dream of is actually adding one glue onto the picture, all right? And so I, I, I'm not going, there, there's different ways to do that. I, I'm going in to try and stick with uh, one thing and comment on all the others later. One thing that you can, so in, I'm going to first simplify things a little bit. Forgetting about the proton. So if you, look, if you view that process there, and I forget about the proton, at the end of the day, it's just a scattering from between a quark and uh, between a quark and a photon. So if you wish, I'm considering the partonic uh, interaction and taking the proton out. Uh, half an hour from now, we'll put the proton back in. Okay, or maybe 50, hopefully 15 minutes from now, we'll put the proton back in. Uh, so if you do that, the leading order that you'll get, uh, actually the, the, there's one constant. Uh, so I'll denote by hatted uh, notations everything which is, which is related to just the, the, the pure uh, partonic interaction. Uh, so you, instead of having F2, I'm going to call this F2 hat, so that it it's really sticks to saying that I'm just considering interaction between a proton and a photon, and not an interaction between the full proton and a photon. Uh, if you do the leading order for this, you actually find this is EQ squared times uh, delta 1 minus uh, x in this case. And x, again, x in this case is, def is defined with respect to the scattering of the proton. So it's not exactly, uh, maybe let me call this x parton or x at maybe is a, is a better notation in this case, uh, which you can get by just computing this graph, the square of this graph, and uh, use f2 hat, which is as a 1 over 4 pi coming from the equivalent of phase space integration, and mu, and new projector I've introduced somewhere, somewhere. Where did I introduce this projector? Uh, here times uh, the square root of the amplitude. Uh, now, knowing that the amplitude depends on mu and nu in this case because it has uh, an incoming virtual photon in this case that I need to keep track of. So times 2 pi delta uh, p, this is momentum p, plus q squared. So this is if someone wants to reproduce that result, this is the, uh, the calculation to be, do, to be done. So again, I've stripped the proton away. I'll, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about it. It's going to make a blasting return a few minutes from now. All right, so uh, I want to add a glue on to this, all right? Two ways to do this, either Add the glue on here, or add the glue on there. 
So the gluon can either be emitted from the quark in, before it interacts with the photon or after it interacts with the photon. I'm leaving aside vertical corrections at the moment. So that's where you have to roll up your sleeves, square these two guys, compute the amplitude, integrate over the phase space. It's, it's not an outrageously long calculation. Uh, I will swipe the details in other work, just skip to the uh, main steps. I just highlight a few steps in case you want to reproduce it yourself. Otherwise, this is in the, uh, this is in the link that I've promised you, and I will give you hopefully later in the afternoon. Uh, the, the methodology starts at exactly as what we did over and over in the, in the past couple of days. You start with a phase space. The, the phase space here can be written as an integration d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, uh, k here being the momentum of the internal guy there. So yeah, th there's a free momentum here, the proton is fixed. So d4k over 2 pi to the fourth, there's a 2 pi, and then there's on shell condition that if this is q, uh, k plus q and p minus k are both in the final state, so they both need to be on shell. So there's a 2 pi delta of p plus uh, p minus k squared delta of uh, k plus q squared. And I'm going to use the same uh, parametrization as the one I've used here and write down k mu as a psi, some constant psi times a p mu plus a k per squared. I'm going to use directly the fact that k here being internal, it has a negative virtuality, so minus modulus of k squared uh, divided by 2 psi n mu plus some k perp squared, uh, two-dimensional k perp squared, transverse to the pn, uh, the pn plane. Uh, if you do that, you can actually, it's a trivial change of variable to switch between d4k to d xi, dk squared, dk perp squared, d, well, d2 k perp. Uh, you, yeah, so you have now to integrate the square of this amplitude over xi, k square, and d to k perp with the constraints that p minus k and k plus q have to be uh, squared, uh, have to be massless or, or on shell. Uh, again, I'd say it takes about half an hour to an hour to do the full calculation. Uh, my goal here is not to bother you with details and rather try to discuss important physics points. So one important physics point here that simplifies the calculation and especially the interpretation of the calculation is that we're going to work in a, a specific gauge. So that calculation, whatever gauge you're using, you get the same answer. Uh, there's one specific choice that actually makes your life easier when we come to discuss the physics, which is the axial gauge. At the end of the day, the result is truly gauge invariant, and that, that's not uh, necessarily easy to see, but uh, I'm going to assume that n dot a equals zero, which means in particular that whenever you have a sum of a photon Again, I'm trying to keep the same notations, epsilon alpha, epsilon beta of P minus K for the gluon, the polarization of the gluon here. This can be written as minus G alpha beta plus uh, P minus K alpha and beta plus uh, P minus K beta and alpha over N that p minus k. Uh, if you actually make that choice, uh, deep down there's an actually an important reason to make that choice. Uh, with that, you can compute the square of uh, the square of this graph. So the first thing you're going to do is compute the square of this guy. And if for this guy, the squared amplitude, you're actually going to find that n mu n mu times m mu nu squared is equal to 32 
and this is where half an hour of work goes, eq squared alpha s psi some function of psi times uh, 1 over modulus of k squared with p of psi being cf times 1 plus psi squared over 1 minus psi. So this is one of the first results I'm going to use in what follows. Uh, fine, N not overly ending uh, at this stage. One of the interests in actually using this gauge choice is that you can actually show, or this uh, specific choice for polarizations in another way, is that you can actually show that all the other graphs, so the interference term, this graph here, and both interference terms, that plus the complex conjugate of this guy, uh, these graphs compared to this one are actually suppressed by powers of Q. So they're essentially suppressed by these, compared to this one, they're suppressed by some power of k over q compared to the square of this guy. Uh, sorry for writing anywhere on the board. I'd like to keep the bottom for one extra result. In terms of interpreting the results, it's interesting because it means that actually you can, you have the square of this graph, having only one graph to focus on, where the graph has one quark here, one glue on there, and then, then some quark line to close everything, is easier than having to contemplate a, a, a series of graphs, okay? So this choice is actually just merely a way to, uh, to organize the perturbative calculation in a way that, uh, that is a bit more transparent when it comes to discussing physics, uh, which we will do in, uh, in, in 15 minutes, hopefully. So, if you do that, what you do get is, first, F2 hat is uh, the integration of a dit over that phase space. After simplification, you get EQ squared. So you can do some of the integrations, alpha s over 2 pi squared, the integration 2 pi squared. Okay, let me have 2 pi squared, not 100% sure about the factor of 2 here. Uh, d modulus of k squared over modulus of k squared times an integration between two values, xi minus and xi plus, I'm going to specify in one second, uh, d xi. You get rid of the k perp integration by using the two, uh, the two momentum conservations here, and you get some xi, p of xi over square root of psi minus psi minus, psi plus minus psi, and in this notation, psi plus or minus is x plus z minus 2xz, so minus square root of z. I actually could actually live without this result, but now that I started, let's, let me finish, with z equals modulus of k squared, well, modulus of uh, k squared over 2 nu, and remember x is q squared over 2 nu, okay? In principle, this integration here goes all the way to the, the, the upper kinematic bound is 2 nu on the q squared integration. All right, let's talk physics now that we are at this stage. Try to look at this expression for stare at it for as long as it takes to tell me what's weird about this expression. There's something particularly embarrassing here. 1 over k square, there's no, nothing that prevents me here to take k square as soft as I want red light, we're again coming back to infrared stuff, uh, that blows up. This damn thing is not finite. All right? So, let's try to discuss it if it's not finite. Uh, what do I need here? I can probably get rid of this for the moment. 
So, before really getting into, into physics expression, if, so you're interested in this expression in knowing what happens when k square becomes small, right? So if k square becomes small, I can actually use the same kind of arguments that I used by saying we were working the Bjorken limit where q square is large. That means that z is actually much smaller than, than q squared. If k square, if k square becomes small, then this is much smaller than this, all right? No big, uh, no big surprise in here. And in that case, I can actually neglect z in this expression, and so you see that if you take z going to zero here, both psi plus and psi minus are actually going to x. They're starting to go closer and closer to x. Uh, this is good. This is good. It means that essentially, uh, in this limit, uh, the uh, longitudinal momentum of this guy k here, which is psi, psi is actually again going back to x, which restores our initial picture that when k square becomes small, the, uh, the photon is interacting with the quark that carries a fraction x of the proton momentum. So this is, this is the first thing which is good, that we're starting to get somewhere here. Or at least you should get a feeling that we're starting to get somewhere here. Uh, nope, this goes this way. Uh, second, if both these guys come close to x, I can actually factor this guy out and replace it by x psi of x in here. I can just take it out and say this is x times psi of x, and then you get a stupid integration between psi minus and psi plus of 1 over the square root, where everyone should here know that this just gives you a factor of pi, which cancel the factor of the, the pi square here, and I think now that I've got this, the factor of 2 there is correct. So if you do that, you do get that f2 hat, is alpha s over 2 pi times the integration between uh, something and 2 nu, the modulus of k squared over modulus of k squared times uh, x p of x end of story. Okay, so assuming that, well, pointing out that we do have an issue when k square is small, we've actually been able to simplify this a little bit, uh, keeping in mind that we're actually going to be dominated, this integration is actually going, going to be dominated by small values of, of, of q squared. So far, so good. All right, so that doesn't solve our problem at all. This is still divergent, okay? Infrared QCD. Okay. Uh, the big question here, and that's the one I'm going to spend the rest of the discussion handling and discussing consequences and, and, and current uh, state of the art of this field, uh, is how do I get, well, in practice, is photon proton scattering divergent? I'm not sure, in terms of stability of the universe, I'm not sure that would be, uh, that would be good. Uh, so that means you need something to get rid of this divergence. It's infrared. So the first question is, is it perturbative or non-perturbative? Uh, there's me a first question about that. It's not the first time we're, we encounter something like that, right? Not as far as yesterday or, or even maybe Monday. We already had something like that. Remember the case of thrust, for example, or the case of E plus E minus collisions. We all also had there that the emission of a, the emission of a gluon was becoming divergent in the, in the infrared limit. And the situation here is exactly the same. If P minus K becomes, becomes on shell, essentially this is on shell and this becomes on shell as well. So the, the, the situation here is exactly the same. When you do emit something, there is, well, there is a propagator going on shell when in some, in some kinematic configurations in this case. So this being either soft, or in this case, it's actually this becoming collinear to P. So P minus K becoming collinear to K is actually the source of this one over modulus of K squared divergence here that we're interested in. Uh, why is it collinear and not soft? 
Uh, it's mostly related to the fact that P minus K is essentially, this is a longitudinal momentum fraction which is, which is essentially one, and this is a longitudinal momentum fraction which is a generic X. And I told you that I'm working at finite X, I'm not trying to get close to X equals one or something like that. So this means that in this case, the energy of this guy for any finite X is actually a finite energy. So the only source of the divergence I can have is collinear. Uh, again, I told you I'm working the Bjorken limit. There's other limits in which this, uh, this soft divergence can, uh, can become relevant, in particular if you start getting close to x equals 1 in this, uh, in the, in this picture. So this is a collinear kind of divergence to make a link between what we had yesterday. Any idea how to fix that? Is there anything either I'm missing uh, or something that I'm going to say, at some point there's the pi and mass, I don't care? Uh, anyone has an idea to save the day? Virtual. Ah, not quite. Not quite. Uh, you can do the calculation. Essentially, virtual corrections in this case, uh, the integration of a disk, remember, you always interact with, the, look at what you interact with at the end of the day. You only have, the kinematic constraint is the, in this graph, are essentially the exact kinematic constraint we had in the leading order diagrams, the one we did we at the top there, and so this thing is just going to be a contribution proportional to delta of one minus x, or x hat in this, uh, in this case, all right? So this, this kind of interaction only works if uh, uh, at the one specific point in X, not exactly a one minus X in this, in this case. There's, there's a bit of uh, abuse annotation here. Uh, so the virtual corrections here are only going to live in one specific point in X. They're not going to solve this at any uh, intermediate value of X. So let me cross this out. You need something else. There's one other thing that we haven't, that we have forgotten since 20 minutes. I told you it was going to make a brilliant comeback. Now is the time to call it back. The proton. Ha ha. This quark here is coming from a proton. So how to do this? Well, the first thing to do is, let me, j just for the sake of the argument, okay, uh, let me introduce, or do I need to introduce this? Uh, maybe not, I can probably live without it, so let's try to live without it. Uh, w one way, again, maybe just to discuss physics, uh, one way here, you could say, I'm going to introduce an infrared regulator here, and so this integration here would, in that case, give you something which is alpha s over 2 pi times x p of x, times uh, log, it's log two nu over mu square, but since I'm interested in the, in, in the fixed Q square, in high Q square fixed Q limit, the dominant term is actually the Q one, uh, log Q square over mu square plus subleading corrections, okay? So the dominant behavior here is really a logarithm of Q square over some soft scale to be determined, all right? Or well, ultimately we want to take mu square to zero, either leave it here or keep it to zero at the moment, all right? So, we need to get the proton. So at the end of the day, the full process, which is coming from the proton here, is not exactly the same one as the one we had here. Uh, in particular, you need to say, at the end of the day, the quark I'm interested, w I'm interested in uh, can come with any possible fraction of the proton momentum. And so this uh, quark photon matrix element has to be convoluted with the distribution of quarks inside my proton, all right? So at the end of the day, it means that the final F2 of, say, Again, I'm keeping X, uh, let me give F2, has to be some form of integration uh, between X and, well, if, if this is X, this thing has at least to have a momentum X. So this guy here has to have at least a longitudinal momentum bigger than X, otherwise there's no way I'm going to be able to interact with the quark of momentum fraction X here. So it can have any momentum between X and one. Uh, I do apologize for that. Uh, xi is the usual choice notation. This Xi is not the one that's the internal, uh, variable here, uh, yeah, 
mistake I made 10 years ago that I'm still carrying now. Uh, so I'm just trying to keep the same notations I'm using in the notes I'm going to send you the link of. Uh, so sticking with Xi here. Uh, some, so I'm saying I'm going to take some quark of momentum Xi out of the proton here, and then what happens with this? Well, there's, first of all, the, if I take some momentum of uh, some quark of momentum Xi, there's the leading order term, which is uh, which is the case where there's no gluons, which is delta of 1 minus x over xi, which would reproduce this f2 we've been discussing in the past. And then there's a first order correction we've discussed here, plus alpha s over 2 pi, uh, I'm missing a factor x in front of everything, uh, p of x over xi times uh, essentially the integration between up to to new. I can replace Q nu by Q squared uh, because I'm interested in the, in the Bjorken limit, K squared here. I think I'm forgetting, yes, I'm forgetting a factor E Q squared on top of everything, all right? So this is where we stand. Once I've taken the proton back into the game, I just need to integrate over all possible momentum here. There's a first term, the leading order term, which is the one we had computed in the past, which is just going to give you x eq squared q of x. And then there's the correction where I can have any emission of a photon here. Does that help? Well, uh, it better zoom. It better help. So how does that help? I'm just going to introduce a random scale. This is the integration up to some scale, mu squared, the modulus of k squared over k squared, plus the integration between that scaled and q squared. Can I do something with this guy? It is some trick that you've certainly seen in a different context at some point. Well, you need to integrate it out somewhere. Where does it go? Nope. Why not? Not the charge. There's something else. Charge goes renormalized by UV divergences, if you wish, not by uh, soft gluon emissions or collinear gluon emissions. Remember, exactly. Remember, this gluon here can be viewed as collinear with the quark, so standing from a high scale point of view, at some point there's no way to distinguish. Uh, if that gluon here is a very low virtuality, it essentially means it's getting more and more collinear to this. From the point of view of the photon, there's no way I'm going to be able to differentiate one from the other if I go to soft enough scales. And so this means that you can view this collinear gluon as being some sort of dressing the quark density inside the proton. So what I'm going to do here is say, well, 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 this quark density is actually not really the quark density, it's a bare quark density. The same way as you would have a bare charge in a renormalization kind of thing. And that is sufficient to save the day because now I can say Q of, well, I can define Q as being Q bare of X uh, plus the integration between X and 1 d xi over xi uh, P of x over xi alpha s over 2 pi times the integration uh, up to mu squared d modulus of k squared over k squared. Uh, 
and then write that F2, in this case, I can replace Q bear by this. Uh, of course, Q bear multiplies this term, which is going to, uh, well, this term combines with this one to give me the new Q. And then I'm left with Q bear convoluted with this guy. At this order of the perturbation theory, uh, I can actually replace Q bear by the, by the full Q. So what you do get here is just that this is X times EQ squared times integration between X and one D Psi over Xi, Q of whatever happens here, X, uh, delta 1 minus X over Xi, plus alpha S over 2 pi, P of X over Xi, times the integration between mu squared and Q squared. So let me put this as log of Q squared over mu squared. There's a small price to pay here. What nice relation did we have half an hour ago? And it now depends on the scale. So this Q here now explicitly depends on X here, but also depends on its X and mu squared. And as a consequence, F2 here now depends on X and Q squared. There's one specific value of mu square that I can take here that simplifies the day. If I take mu square equal to q square, this is just x eq square of x eq square times uh, q of x and q square. Is there anything I need? Is there anything I'm obvious I'm missing here? Something that. Uh, so, uh, so far I've just essentially taken all the dirt, that's the dirt, and swiped it under the Q-reg, all right? Uh, does that come with any additional information? This stage, so this, this relation here is valid, right? There's still some extra information in this line compared to this one. What are the variables we're using in the left and right hand side of this equation? Or said differently, what are the variables we're using here? Uh, the left hand side here depends on x and q square. The right hand side depends on x, q square, and mu. Does that ring any bell? The right hand side must be independent of mu. All right. So where am I going to? I'll probably keep this one and drop this uh, and drop this one here. So this means that. So, I've initially, I've just introduced some random mu scale to regularize the divergence at zero here, okay? I'm saying I'm just introducing a regulator here. Uh, the divergent term, I put it together with the charge. So, it was, uh, sorry, you disturbed me. Uh, I put it together with the quark distribution, saying actually my quark distribution is not really a quark distribution, it's a bare quark distribution. And now I actually have something which is a quote unquote renormalized quark distribution, which now obviously depends on x and also depends on my regulator mu squared. All right? So at the end of the day, if you do that, you do get an expression where uh, essentially with this quote unquote renormalized core distribution, uh, you've hidden the uh, infrared divergence inside the core distribution. Uh, the procedure is actually exactly the same as the one you would have with UV renormalization. You try to compute a loop diagram, loop diagram diverges in the UV, and you're going to say, I don't care. 
My divergence is, goes into the uh, renormalization of the mass, the renormalization of the charge, the, the renormalization of my Lagrangian uh, parameter, wave functions, charm, uh, wave functions, masses, uh, couplings, and so on. Uh, the, the idea here is exactly the same. I'm having an object. The density of partons in my proton is intrinsically a non-perturbative object. I, but uh, I'm going to hide the QCD divergence in that object quote unquote renormalizing it and if you do that renormalization my renormalized again renormalization here is to be taken with a grain of salt because it's infrared and not UV but renormalized like uh, quark distribution is allowing me to get a finite result at the end of the day so Q bear is infinite but after renormalization I get something finite and in this case uh, the same way as when you do that in the renormalization in the UV you do get a renormalization group equation that tells you how the couplings and masses run when you change the scale if you now impose that either we take the, the mu squared derivative either in this definition or in this definition what you do get is that the mu squared times the derivative with respect to mu squared of Q of X and mu squared is going to be the alpha, well, the integration between X and one, d xi over xi times P of, well, of S over two pi, P of X over xi times Q of xi and mu squared. This together with F2 is X EQ squared Q of X and Q squared. The last 20 minutes, so this is the main result I am going to derive today. This is essentially the only result I'm going to derive today. Uh, I'm going to spend the last 20 minutes discussing this result in ver various flavors of this result. Uh, first, the, uh, the first observation is that we started with point-like objects, quarks, and we had the beautiful result that F2 was independent of Q squared. Ha! QCD tells you no, no. At the end of the day, uh, because of QCD gluon emissions, you do get a dependence on Q square as well. Uh, second, uh, what you learn essentially from this normalization like procedure is that the bare quark, the, the, really the quark, the density of quarks in the proton is, is, is it's, it's a little bit like the charge and masses in the Lagrangian. They're not really, uh, they're, they have a bare value which is, which is not known. You need to measure them. They're not, they're not known in a way. There's no way to predict. You can do renormalization. Renormalization, renormalization is not predicting the value of the electromagnetic coupling or the value of the electron mass. Uh, in the same way, QCD is not predicting the value of the quark distribution inside the proton. On the other hand, what it's predicting, it's how this distribution evolves with the scale mu square. The same way that you don't know the charge of the electron, but you know how it evolves with, with the scale you're looking at. All right? So it's exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, QCD is not intrinsically speaking the distribution of quarks in the proton is still a non perturbative object. You can try computing as a lattice uh, on a lattice if uh, if that's what you're uh, you're up to. But what perturbative QCD is able to tell you is if you go to high enough values of mu square, then I can tell you how this guy evolves. All right. Uh, this comes with several remarks. The first one is. Uh, a physical interpretation of this. Essentially what I'm telling you here is that if I'm trying to look at some very high Q-square scale, so imagine my high Q-square means, as we said at the very beginning, high Q-square means small distances. So if I'm trying to look at the proton at very small distances, ultimately I'm still somehow sensitive to what happens at uh, 
very large scales in the proton. So if I'm trying to imagine this is my proton, very big proton, I'm trying to look at a very small distance, high Q square in here. What I'm essentially telling you is that I can sort of draw an intermediate scale in here. So that would be one over Q, this would be my one over mu in this, in, this, in this sense. And then say, I can actually predict what happens in between those two scales uh, and relating it that to still pushing the non-perturbative bits and pieces further away. So it means essentially that at some point, the, the dynamics between different soft scale, between different uh, small distance, so hard scales, in this case, high Q square scales, uh, the evolution between these two scales can be predicted uh, is independent of what happens in the non-perturbative large distance picture. Uh, I'm still not able to predict everything for, from first principles, but I can still relate, it, relate different hard scales one to another. Uh, so in a way, the, the dynamics that happens in the high, high energy limit, in that sense, that dynamic becomes independent of uh, long distance some physics, which I can always, all the soft physics degrees of freedom, I can factor them out inside one object. Uh, and this is important because it, it has some degree of universality here. If I'm colliding whatever with the proton, every proton, if I change the scale and look at a proton at a different scale, I'm always going to be able to say, well, all the soft degrees of freedom which are ugly and delicate, potentially non-perturbative, diverge, and whatever, all these soft physics, I hide them into a single object. There's one object here where I hide all the collinear divergences in the initial state, in this case, and at the end of the day, I cannot predict that object exactly, but I know how it evolves with the scale. So, uh, a connection with what I said earlier in E plus E minus collisions, this is again an infrared divergence. In this case, collinear, uh, the difference is that what we did in E plus E minus collisions was an infrared divergence in the final state of the collision, in the particles which were produced in the final state of the collision. What I'm essentially doing here is instead in the initial state of the collision, where I'm essentially saying that if this one here is below a certain value, if, if this is such that the value of k square here is below a certain mu square scale here, I'm actually just saying this gluon is part of the proton. I'm reabsorbing this gluon inside the proton, saying there's a scale mu squared I have here, and everything which is below mu square, I hide it in the proton. So you're essentially able to say there's an intermediate scale high enough, bigger than the proton mass, smaller than Q square, for which every soft and collinear physics that happens at smaller scale, I reabsorb it in the proton. Again, same way as you would do in, in a renormalization context. Uh, so the, the rule of thumb is final state divergence cancels against virtual corrections. Initial state collinear divergence gets reabsorbed inside the proton. All right? Uh, what else? Uh, I think this is, yeah, from now I only have s smallish remarks. Uh, anything that rings a bell, if I go back to the expression P of X is CF times 1 plus X squared over 1 minus X. Any, there are at least two comments on this guy. Well, I have two comments. Maybe you can find something else. Uh, first, what if x goes to 1? Yeah, x going to one. If you go back to what I had, if you go back to what I had initially with this kind of emission, if this has a fraction, partonic fraction one, this had a fraction uh, x in here, it means essentially this guy is becoming soft. So, infrared divergences still have both soft and collinear. In this case, the fact that I've forced myself to work in the Bjorken limit, which means high Q square X fixed, uh, has allowed me to focus on Carinaya divergences. 
uh, there's still soft divergences hidden somewhere. Okay, they, 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 they're not going away just because I'm going in, in one case or another. If you now decide to go to x very close to 1 or x very close to 0 in, in, in different cases, uh, this is a case where I'm still sensitive to soft gluon emissions in one way or another. Uh, so this is, there's still a trace of the soft, uh, of the soft divergence. Now, what happens in this case if I find z equals 1 minus x? you do get CF times 1 plus 1 minus Z squared over Z. Any any familiarity with this? This is exactly the splitting function we had yesterday when we said E plus E minus into QQ bar where this quark emits a collinear gluon. This is actually non-trivial. Collinear, collinear splittings, so this, this P of X is really describing the collinear splitting of that quark inside into a quark that carries a fraction X. So if this is one, this carries a fraction X of this one. And in that case, this is a fraction one minus X, all right? That's really saying I'm describing the collinear splitting of a guy into a guy which carries a fraction x of it and a gluon which carries a fraction 1 minus x. And if you remember what we did yesterday, we had a guy, a gluon, carrying a fraction z and a quark, a fraction 1 minus z. So if you just say I'm switching between z and 1 minus x, uh, these two things are exactly the same. Uh, the, the key point here is that they're the same whether they're in the initial state or in the final state. All right? Uh, that's the two remarks I want you to do for P of X. Next, haha. Uh, do you only have quarks in the proton? Is there any other, if, if I'm trying to discuss interaction between the parton and the photon at first non-trivial alpha is order, is there any other kind of diagram that I need to consider? Sure. Uh, the photon has to interact with the quark. Is there any way to get a quark outside of the proton different from just saying I'm pulling out a quark of the proton? A gluon. I like am saying I'm... So remember, now that in, in the past, in the first Bjorken scaling case, uh, we, on, we only had essentially quarks. It was a quark parton model of the proton. Now that we've taken QCD, I all know, we also know that we have gluons, so I can very well have a gluon outside of the proton. And if I have a gluon, this means I also have a parton density function for the gluon. So we also have a G of X and Q squared, which describes the density of gluons inside the proton with a momentum fraction X when I observe things at a, a certain uh, virtuality scale Q squared. Uh, and if I have this, this means that I can have all sorts of branchings. We've seen that if you have a branching of a quark into a quark and a gluon, where this is, this is fraction x, this goes with pqq of x, which is cf1 plus uh, x squared over 1 minus x. You can also have the other splitting that we saw yesterday, where the gluon is a fraction x, this is pgq of x, which we saw yesterday, 1 plus 1 minus x squared over 1 minus x, over x, sorry. You can have a gluon splitting into a qq bar pair, which is what you'd get in this kind of thing, if this is x and 1 minus x. That gives you pqg of x, which is... Uh, one half x squared plus one minus x squared. And I'll come back to that in a second. You can have a gluon split into glue glue, uh, that's x and one minus x, with PGG of x, which is CA times x over one minus x plus one minus x over x plus x one minus x. And again, you recognize the soft divergences. When the gluon becomes soft, 
means x goes to 1, there's a 1 over 1 minus x divergence. In this case, when x goes to 0, there's a 1 over x divergence. In this case, both x and 1 minus x can become close to 0, in which case you have these two divergences here, all right? Uh, this can be straightforwardly calculated from here. This can be calculated from final state. All these guys can actually be calculated from final state. Uh, actually, fairly easily. It's uh, not such a complicated exercise. At the end of the day, it actually means that instead of having the uh, simple equation up there, you do have... Uh, a matrix equation, if you wish, because quarks and gluons can branch into one another, meaning that uh, the equation should be mu squared d mu squared of either q of x and q squared or g of x and mu squared and q squared equals, again, to the integration between x and 1 d psi over psi uh, alpha s over 2 pi p of x over psi times some splitting qq. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. This doesn't work. Uh, some splitting qq of x over psi, some splitting qg of x over psi, splitting gq or gg of x over psi times q of psi and q squared. Uh, this is q squared if I'm flipping between one and the other. Uh, g of psi and q squared. Uh, knowing that this is actually even a little bit simplified because in practice there's uh, several there's quark and antiquarks and different flavors of them. So in principle, you actually end up with something like uh, maximum 13 different parent distribution functions, one for ev every of the six quarks, one for every of the six antiquarks, and one for the gluons, right? So two remarks left. Uh, by the way, this is something called either the DGLAP, or since I'm in Italy, I should probably call this the Altarelli Parisi equation. Uh, which is the AP at the end here, at the end there. Uh, D stands for Dukchitzer, and GL stands for Gribov and Lipatov. It was, you know, this was discovered back in the days where uh, Russia was still Russia. Well, U USSR was still USSR, and uh, and there was not always a hundred percent internet communication between the East and the West, uh, meaning that actually that thing was discovered mostly at the same time by the Russian team and the Italian team. Uh, so, uh, that was actually not really a remark. The second non-remark is that alpha s in principle runs uh, the nat only natural scale you can take for alpha s is alpha s of q squared in case you want to include running coupling corrections, since that has been asked in the past. Uh, there's actually a very interesting property of this. So, this is really a factorization picture that we have here, right? you really be able to tell that whatever interaction between a proton and a photon, I'm able to write it down as some hard interaction. In this case, the hard interaction is trivial, is the interaction between a quark, and a, fo uh, a quark and a photon, which is just a delta function in a way, eq squared times x times a delta function, and some uh, non perturbative object, meaning, as I said earlier, I can send all the non-perturbative soft physics inside this, uh, this PDFs. Uh, this, act, this result actually holds up to all orders in perturbation theory. So this guy here, at all orders, you can replace it by alpha s over 2 pi times a leaning order splitting function plus an alpha s over 2 pi squared times the next to leading order splitting function, and so on and so forth. So there is a perturbative expansion of this guy, but the fact that you can, you can factorize soft distance, soft physics, small, large distances from hard physics, really the interaction between that hard 
parton and, and, the, and the, the photon, this holds at any order of the perturbation theory. I can only recommend reading proof of this. It's actually a very nice, uh, the, there's actually nice uh, quantum field theory papers uh, back in the early 80s uh, showing this factorization. Uh, current state of the art is alpha cube. Discovered as far as I remember around 2003 or 4. Uh, so this, what I did here was early, was mid 70s. Uh, next leading order was early 80s. Next, next leading order was 20 years later. It's not an easy calculation. Uh, so this is history. State of the art. Why do I care about PDFs? No one's doing E plus E minus collision. Well, no, I, I'm taking that back immediately. Uh, there are still even uh, prospects for E plus uh, hadron colliders, in particular an electron hyon collider uh, in the pipelines in the US. Uh, in that case, it's probably scattering on heavy ions, which includes other kind of physics. But uh, Everyone here is talking BSM and, and, and kind of LHT physics. It's not EP. Uh, so why do I care about this? LHT is scattering. There's no way you can get away with understanding something about the proton. That's how I'm going to start tomorrow without knowing anything about, about the proton structure, right? You want to do LHC physics at high energy, you'll, from line one, you're going to having to know something about the proton, the structure of the proton, meaning you need to know something about PDFs. So that means that if you want to do precision physics at the LHC, you need several things. I'll explain that tomorrow. In particular, you need a good control over PDFs. And a good control over PDF involves one going to sufficiently high order of the perturbation theory so that you do get good precision. Two, these things are not predicted from QCD. Haha, -ha. how do you get them? Louder? No. Uh, there might be lattice simulations, uh, not, the, uh, not the standard way. How do you get the strong coupling constant, or how do you get the electron mass, or how do you get the, uh, you do get them from? From data, same thing here. You do get these guys from data. Uh, the main player here is the Hera collider built at the DESI, uh, uh, at the DESI lab in Hamburg, close to Hamburg, where these things have been measured over decades in Q squared, decades in X, and the method is easy. You use that equation. You're saying, I'm going to take some parameterization of X and Q squared, add some initial scale Q squared, take a form which depends on a few parameters, use that equation to predict it at N scale X and Q squared, fit to the data, by adjust your parameter, your free parameters in your initial condition by feeding to the data, and you get some PDF with some uncertainty. This is still uh, an active field today because the precision you have on PDF has a direct impact on the precision you have on your LHC physics. For example, it has impacts everywhere. They're interesting objects per se, but they have a direct impact on what happens at the, at the LHC. Uh, I think I've said all I wanted except one thing that I can, uh, that I can neglect for the moment.